Okay. All right, so um, I handed my papers already to those from whom I got one. And Roy, you were made to do yours again. Do you have yours? <laughs> well, that's hopeful. Maybe is better than no. Yes. Well, it depends on the question, doesn't it? Do, do I have, you know, a, an incurable disease? Maybe is not better than no. <laughs> Here, just a second, Bailey. Oh, he's searching. Yeah. Does it help you search when I just stare at you? Probably not. Okay, how about if we go over here and we answer Bailey's question? As I drag my... Oh, I, it means nothing. It means I was thinking of something else while I was writing and apparently I wrote gibberish. That's what that means. That's what happens. It was... Oh, oh, no, here's... This is a fine story, but not as bad. It, this was the story. This was the assignment. It was to write this. And so I feel like you spent a lot of time on the early and then just not much on the after, and it would have been nice to spread it out. So that was it. This is the assignment. It was to write colon this. Make sense? And then what do you mean by this? Oh. Oh, okay. So can I just share this with her? Do you mind if I share this with her? Because this is good. So I wrote on Bailey's, and I think I could have written this on many people's. Um, you could take your stories to the next level. Oh, my microphone is hiding. By um, being specific. For example, instead of saying a small cottage, he, he could see a small cottage with a thatched roof and tiny windows, it's disrepair hiding the poverty within. You see, and that really describes it. So when we write stories, when we write fiction, and you can keep this in mind because you're gonna do another one this week. Um, really? Um, I know, I know, I need to start asking my husband for that. Um, when, we're, when we're specific about things, when we describe things very specifically, it really makes your writing come alive. And so instead of a tree, it could be an oak. It could be a, a, a scarred and broken oak, scarred from lightning strikes, I don't know. But then do you see how tree conjures up a very nebulous picture in your mind? Because there's lots of trees, right? There's evergreen trees and there's deciduous trees, but when you're very specific, then it, ooh, it really makes the picture come alive in your mind. And when you read fiction, Making the picture come alive in someone's mind really helps. Yeah, right. You know, that good job throwing your relatives under the bus. For your <laughs> but if that is true, then you have to throw your relatives under the bus if it's their fault. It's okay, Roy. Right. Um, we are actually. Well, we're going to do another writing from pictures. But I would like to show you the picture later this morning, okay, after we start talking about books and things. Uh, but I have already, I have a picture, I have a, a sample of it. But I have already emailed this picture to each of your families this morning, okay? It was attached to the, do you know I send a little email out every week to your parents saying this is what we did? Maybe you didn't know that. I do. Uh, so it's attached to that because I didn't want to print out 21 color pictures. So, and that way you didn't even have to print it out if you just want to look at it on the screen at home. Uh, go ahead and get your reading questions out. Did not, I don't have a paper to collect, do I? Because I didn't make you write. I hope you all had a really nice Thanksgiving. One of my uh, Tuesday students spent Thanksgiving having COVID and not being able to taste or smell. Oh, can you imagine Christmas and Thanksgiving, the worst times not to be able to taste things and smell things. But he's fine now. Um, so hopefully nobody was ill or the turkey wasn't burnt. I don't know what disasters could happen for Thanksgiving. You know, we only have this week and next week, and then it's Christmas break. But I'm gonna tell you guys something, because I have parents in here, and also I'm gonna tell you again next week, because sometimes when I say things once, people don't 
listen, I'm sure it's not anybody in here that would do that, but. So, everybody listening, you got it? You're gonna hear it again next week, but. So, the classes that I teach other days, it's a 32 week year. You guys have a 30 week year. So, the good news is, you get a Christmas present, an extra Christmas, of an extra class from me. I know, but it's gonna be on the YouTube, okay? So, they, Simeon, do not, do not. You can watch it in your jammies while you drink cocoa. It's easy, but it will, it will finish up this semester and then take you to next semester. Plus, who needs three weeks off for Christmas break? That's just wrong. I know, I do. I know, okay. That was a, that was a bad question. Um, yeah, I could, I could use more than three probably. Um, I did ask, I, I set myself up for that. So um, the week after we meet, you know, so we meet here next week, and then the week after that, I'm going to record my Tuesday class. And if you would just turn on your computer and watch it. I can't make you do it. I have threatened to like set up surveillance equipment in my students' houses and s sneak. I've threatened to peek in windows and say to your Latin, but I won't because it's illegal, probably. <laughs> and it's too much trouble. I know that. So I can't make you do it. Um, but I will also be sending out an email after that. You know, even we'll, though we won't be meeting, I'll send your parents an email saying, this is what we did this week, even though this week didn't exist here and this is what they're reading for after Christmas, okay? So I will tell you all this again, but anyway, I will send a link. So hopefully you will just putter down in your jammies and slippers with your cocoa or breakfast or whatever while you're lounging around at home and just spend an hour and a half with me on video. Yeah. It's the week, it's not even the week of Christmas. It's the week before the week of Christmas. Hold that. I'm, if we have time at the end, you can revisit that, okay? Um, so I asked you to get your questions out. I asked you to read about education and books. And uh, I didn't ask you, I asked you to read a part of chapter 18. And I didn't ask you any questions on your paper about um, chapter 18, but I wanted to point out a couple of things that Dorothy Mills said. Uh, this is, okay, just a second. Because I feel like this is, I guess I could just do this, can't I? It's not very fashionable, but. All right. Um, she says something, and I would like us to stop and think about it for a minute, because you're here, and if I asked, why are you here? Well, it would be because my parents made me come, for some of you, all right? And that's true when we're a kid sometimes. You might, next level would be to get an education. And then I might say, well, why do you want an education? What, what's that for? And some people might say, well, what would you say? So telling you what you'd say, why, why do we get an education? Okay, so Bailey said two things. I like what Bailey said two things. One, to make money. And I'm just gonna, you guys are young for me to say this, I guess, but if all we're doing here is learning to make money, maybe we should just go outside and play. Do you know what I mean? Because you think about it, you work all your life to make money so you can retire, and what do you do when you retire? You just sort of do whatever you want. Well, let's just go do whatever we want to now. Right? But she also said to be what you want to be. Can I, can I twist that, Bailey, and say, be what God wants us to be? Which I know you would, agree, I'm sure you would agree with, you know. Um, but Ella, what do you want to chime in and say? Okay. It's interesting, but does it do us any good? 
I mean, what, what good can this do us? So we have, just I will go to you too, we, we have ready-made for us examples of people making good choices and people making bad choices. And then we see it lived out in the past. We, we don't have to do it because they did it, and then we can see what happened to them, and then we can think, well, gee, what choice did they make? Do I want to make that choice? Uh, hold on to that thought because Dorothy Mills mentioned that, and Bailey, what were you going to say? And that would be that would go along a little bit with the making money. So we have two we have two paths, right? Practical uses, because we do have to get along in the world. Your parents would like you not to live in their basement and eat their food for the rest of your life. It's fine right now. I mean, I don't know that you have to live in the basement, but it's fine right now. But eventually, they would like you to you know support yourself. But also, there's there's uses that aren't practical. And so, Dorothy, oh my goodness. Dorothy Mills, at the beginning of the chapter 18, says, The wise man of old said that where there is no vision, the people perish. Does anybody know who the wise man was or where that's from? Where there is no vision, the people perish. It's in the Bible. I think it's Isaiah. Mm, don't hold me to that. Prophets, okay? The vision, okay, this is not, that's the end of the Bible quote. The vision that any age holds of supreme importance can generally be seen in the education of the time. I want to say that again. The vision that any age holds supreme, holds of supreme importance, can generally be seen in the education of the time. In other words, whatever people think is important, that's what they will teach their kids. Does that make sense? So if you look at what people are teaching their kids, you can know what that group of people thinks is important. What, see you guys, being homeschooled, it's not quite the same, but what, what are some subjects, what are some areas that people consider of real importance that they really want to teach their kids today? Math. Math. Okay, excellent. Anything else? What, what other sorts of things do people? English. Well, Science. see, okay, so in homeschooling circles, yes, I hate to disagree, you know, I mean, yes, but I don't know, unfortunately, our schools are graduating people that don't really know how to read or write very well, so apparently they're not doing that. I think I'm it's really like oh. different, but that, where there is no revelation, people pass up. What's it is it? It's Proverbs, okay. I was completely wrong. Um, so back to Bailey's math. Math and technology and science. Right? Those, those things get hit hard, don't they? And physical education, which I hate. Okay. <laughs> Ban that from schools when I'm queen. No. Um, we all need exercise. This is true. But we, we as a society really hit what they call STEM. You know, science and technology and engineering and math really hard. What does that say about us? We think that gadgets are important. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but we think our gadgets are important. Maybe more important than literature. Maybe more important than English and thinking. And see, you can see where my loyalties lie, just <laughs> in the way I'm saying it. But anyway, uh, it's interesting, because this was written a long time ago. This book was written about 100 years ago. When education wasn't the same, it's been edited, you know, and updated oh, for w the language. No, she's dead. Dorothy Mills is gone. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to report that. Um, so for education, we'll do two things. It will prepare a child to live intelligently in the world. That was our make money, take over the family business, 
not live in your parents' basement reason, right? Live intelligently in the world. And what is of more importance from the ideals it motivates, I'm sorry, from the ideals and motives it sets up, from the kind of hero it exalts, from the ideas it spreads, education will train and develop character and will give that vision that is needed if the people are not to perish. We're, when you come here or when you sit down to do your work at home, you're actually doing your little part to serve God and I was gonna say save the world. Ensure the future of mankind. That's a that's a big responsibility. And we just don't think about that anymore, you know? Anyway, I'm sorry to digress on that. Uh, on the flip side, <clears throat> even though maybe you don't want to save civilization and, you know, devote yourself to learning, you can be glad that you live today and not in the Middle Ages because did you notice that medieval schools, I will read the quote, all the schools had certain things in common. The discipline was severe. The hours were long, 10 to 12 hours a day. 10 to 12, see, don't you just feel so much better right now? Even though Wednesdays are a long day, it's not 10 to 12 hours. The holidays were short. Just said you guys get three weeks, except for my video. Uh, and you were mostly boys. So all the ladies, I'm sorry, would probably not be here. Although everyone who could get a chance to learn to read would. All right. Um, because they didn't send their kids to school until they were much older. So often reading happened at home if your parents were able to read. If they were not able to read, then obviously they have to send you somewhere else. So hopefully you feel a, a little bit better about your education. Um, I want to read one more thing before we go on to your reading questions. This is a quote from a biography of St. Louis, who, yes, St. Louis, Missouri is named for. He was a crusader king of France. And this is about his um, educating his children. Before he lay down in his bed, he would cause his children to come to him and bring to their minds the deeds of good kings and emperors, telling them it was of such men they should take example. And he would bring to their minds also the deeds of great men who were wicked. And by their ill-doing, their rapine, and their avarice had brought their kingdoms to ruin. Good examples and bad examples. So later on when we talked about Robin Hood, I wanted to talk about whether he's a good example. Don't answer that yet. Okay, the first question, though, I asked you out of chapter 19, let me find it, is what were the two higher branches of learning in the Middle Ages? What did people learn, Simeon? Theology, Theology and philosophy. Mm, I know I got it out. Okay, so you, did, you don't have to write this down, okay? And it's not going to be Latin. Um, it's going to be Greek. So what is theology? It's the study of God. Theos means God, and logos means uh, account or reason or words or language. So like biology is the account of life, bios. So it's what we think about God, what we say about God. What is philosophy? I feel like we talked about this. No. Philo means love. Like Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. Adelphos means brother and Philos means love. What is it? Spell it out. Aristotle. Okay, but he's a guy. And he, he's actually the, the answer to the question coming up, so hold on to that. So, phylos means love, and sophia means wisdom. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. That's literally what it is. And so, these two things, 
What do we say about God? And what do our minds through reason say about everything else? But they, but they would say we can study both of these um, in, in two ways. That I've got, that's a really weird, okay. So we have revelation. God reveals stuff to us. He tells us things we couldn't figure out on our own. That's scripture. And human reason, right? We could use our brains. God gave us brains. We should use them. And in the Middle Ages, they would argue that, obviously, Revelation tells us the most about God. And Revelation shows us a little bit about how to be wise. They would argue that human reason, that we can figure out with our own brains how to be wise, but that we can also use human reason to learn about God. And that's, that's the tricky one for t today. You know, um, you read these medieval uh, writers and they're sort of reasoning their way, proving that there must be a God, y using our minds. But they have some pretty doggone good arguments. So, so they're studying philosophy and theology. And I asked you, the second part of that question was, what name was given to the combination of these? Yes, scholasticism. It's a nice long word. We schola means uh, uh, school. It's where we get the word school from, right? So um, we want to put these together somehow. And so let's go to Bailey's. Uh, what ancient thinker? Bailey was nearly all medieval philosophy. Say it. Do you remember how we said it? Era. Aristotle. That's okay. That's, it is. You know, I, okay, I'm ashamed of this a little bit, but I, on Facebook, I follow all these groups that post stupid memes about the classics. Sorry. And they were saying how if we pronounced everything like Aristotle, like we'd go to Chipotle instead of Chipotle. Yeah, everything that ends with O-T-L-E, if we pronounced it, they do one on Socrates too. Anyway, Aristotle, Bottle. See, some of them work, some of them don't. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. He was a, his teacher was Plato, if you've heard of Plato. And uh, he's easy to pronounce, right? What about Plato? Oh, not Plato, Plato. Um, you might ask, why Aristotle? Why not Plato? Here's why. Do you remember? I've got my fake map up here now, okay? It's not, it's imaginary. It's not fake. It's in my mind. It's real. Okay, so here's Europe, right? And Italy and Greece. And it goes over to Asia and Asia Minor is sticking out. We have Persia. Do you remember that right down the middle, the empire split, the Roman Empire. And the people over here were, were speaking mostly Latin, and, and the people over here were speaking mostly Greek. And <clears throat> so their paths kind of diverged, and they weren't spending a lot of time uh, talking to each other anymore and passing things back and forth. But another group of people that were over here were the Arabs, the Muslim Arabs. And I actually asked you this question, um, I'm skipping down, from whom did the West receive much scientific knowledge? The Arabs. Because they could, they could read the Greek and they translated it into Arabic. And then they, they owned, they took over, now this is North Africa, we're going around to Africa, and then we're up to Spain, and they had taken all of that over. They translated into Arabic, and then people in Spain who could speak Arabic and Latin translated it back into Latin. Why don't you translate Because there weren't very many people who knew both. It was, it was a rarity. It became a rarity, eventually. So we got it in this roundabout way. But 
They only had one writing of Plato in the Middle Ages in, in Europe. And Plato, the, like, the complete, complete works of Plato is a book about this thick, and the print's small too. He wrote a ton, so did Aristotle. But Plato just kind of disappeared for these people. But Aristotle didn't. And Aristotle wrote on everything. He was brilliant. And, and he wrote on science and nature. You know, I I examined plants and animals and how should we divide them up and set up the system that we use today for classification, not exactly as we use today, but basically the same idea. How do we classify animals and plants and rocks into different groups? And then he wrote about poetry and drama, and he wrote about ethics. How should we live? What is a good person? And he wrote about logic. He wrote down the rules of logic that we learn when we study logic. And the West had these things, had these writings of his through the Arabs. So <clears throat> there was a problem, though. And let me read this problem. The teaching of Aristotle and the doctrine of the church did not always agree. And so both these, and as both these authorities were held to be infallibly true, medieval scholars often got into difficulties. You see, if you have two sources and you think they most both must both be true, but they don't agree. That's a problem. Somebody must be wrong. And I feel like all of us in this room would instantly say, yeah, it would be Aristotle who is wrong. They didn't quite see it that way. And it makes them sound a little pagan when I say that, I guess. But I don't, I don't want us to get that idea because they really felt like Aristotle was a brilliant man who saw the truth and that all truth had to agree somehow. Does that make sense? All, if something's true, it has to agree with every single other thing that's true. Right? Right? True things can't disagree with each other, or they wouldn't both be true. They wouldn't both match reality. It's a problem when you love Aristotle so much and you think he's so brilliant, but then, oh, that doesn't agree with what the church teaches us. So I asked you, what was the chief work of St. Thomas Aquinas? Yeah, give it to me, Jesse. Yes. He was, and he wrote a, I agree with everything you said, he wrote a particular book. Anybody else wants to do it? I'm gonna let Bailey do it. You wanna try it? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Summa. Summa theologica. Sometimes people write summa theologica, but I always hear theologia. Yes. He tried to put those two together. And he wrote just an enormous literary piece. I didn't even call it a book because it's volumes and volumes. I, I, it's many volumes. I, all I've had, I had a 700 page condensed, it's called the Summa of the Summa. And then you can get a condensed oh, Summa of the Summa, which is the shorter Summa. Is that uh, Yes, it, well, it, it, summa, it means uh, the pinnacle collection of all our knowledge on a subject. When you collect all your knowledge on a subject, sum, the addition, exactly, very good. And theologica obviously means theology of our knowledge about God. So he goes through in this book, and he just point by point, he says, uh, he asks a question, whether, whether God has a body. And then he'll say, some people say, and he'll argue against it, and then he'll give a scripture reference or he'll reference Aristotle and say, but I say that, and, and it goes over and over, he says over and over. You don't want to read a lot of it at once, I'm just saying. He spent his life doing this because he really believed that all, tr all truth and all knowledge was connected. 
And so if we can just bring it all together and use our minds, because God gave us minds, that we would be able to harmonize it all. It would all make sense together. So uh, it, it t Dorothy Mills tells us that he was brilliant when he was young. Oh yeah, Rhett, go ahead. I read this shorter summa. I've read the shorter summa. Yeah, but not the, no, not the whole, no. Yeah, no, I read the shorter summa. But you'd read it in little parts, and then I lent it to someone and they didn't give it back. So it's on my Amazon wish list. <laughs> oh, no, he was old. He was an old man, and I just, and then they moved into assisted living, and I just didn't want to do it. Anyway, not a problem. Um, no, it's, I can, it's less than $20. I can get myself another one. No. Elle is very worried about my, my outlay. And he's a nice, and he's a nice old man. He's worth the 20 bucks. Well, if he stole your book, I don't know. Well, he's, he's a little forgetful. I don't think he stole it, anyway. Okay, so, Dorothy Mills tells us that Thomas Aquinas was really a good student, but, and maybe this will make some of you, I don't know if any of you fall into this category, and hopefully you're not getting ugly nicknames from anyone else like he did, but he was the sort of person you ever known someone who just really, when you ask them something, they think a while and they respond slowly? They're just sort of slow thinkers, but long thinkers. You're looking at each other like, no, it's not us. Um, I, I'm afraid I am not. I am a blurter. As you have probably noticed, I'm a blurter, and I should probably be a little more thoughtful in my answers. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, oh, okay. well, that's interesting. Um, Thomas Aquinas, when he was a little boy, even was a slow thinker. And so his classmates apparently called him the dumb ox. Makes me sad. But he was a brilliant man. And they, and they said once, he was just a little, you know, those sort of absent-minded professor types that they're in a social situation, but they're not really paying attention to any of the conversation because they're thinking their own thoughts. And they say once he was at a dinner party, you know, and he just was eating and he's just thinking. And then finally, he, he just smacks his hand down on the table. He says, that'll settle those you know, whatever heretics he was thinking about. Because the whole dinner he'd been thinking about arguments to refute a Christian heresy, and he wasn't really listening to the dinner too. Anyway, so he spent that, his life, he was a- That's someone who, you know, like, at that, like, you can't, like, stop. You do, you need to be with the people you're with. I'm not recommending this not for when you go to Christmas parties. Don't just ignore everyone around you and think deep thoughts. But he couldn't help it. It was just in his nature. And uh, so he wrote this enormous book, and Dorothy Mills does not tell you this story, but the story of Thomas Aquinas is that he, he didn't live, I don't know, should she tell us? He didn't live much past 50. Yeah, he was not even 50 years old when he died. He did all of this, and I'm 55. I've written nothing. Um, he had a vision of some sort. And we do not know because I guess that sort of thing is rather personal. Sometimes people don't share a vision of God, a vision of truth, a vision of the vastness of God's wisdom. We don't know. But afterwards, he said, everything I have written is straw. It's nothing. When you see the real deal, and when you know how awesome God is, this enormous body of writing where I'm trying to use my brain to understand God is straw. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, don't read it, because Thomas Aquinas said it was straw. And he, he also, there's also a story about Thomas Aquinas that he was praying in the chapel once, and he was praying that God would... Uh, you know, bless his work, that God would give him wisdom. And he heard a voice and it said, you have written well of me, Thomas. 
you have written well. But written well doesn't mean written the complete story, does it? There's just more to God than we're ever going to be able to understand. Do you guys remember, I, I think maybe I told you this story last year, St. Augustine, who was another brilliant man, and he loved to think, and he was very curious. They say once he was walking along the seashore, and he saw a little boy, and he dug a hole in the sand, and he was bringing buckets of water, and he was putting it in the hole, and he said, what are you doing? And the little boy said, I'm putting the ocean in the hole. And Augustine said, yeah, you know, you're not going to be able to put the ocean in the hole. Do you know that? And he turned away, but then he heard a voice behind him, and the boy was transformed, and he was an angel. And he said, and Augustine, you are never going to be able to put all the knowledge of God into your little brain. That's what you're trying to do, and you're never going to be able to do it. It's too much. It's too big. Anyway. But I'm not absolving you from learning and study. Like Mrs. Ferguson said, we can't ever learn everything, so we're just going to quit. No, that's not what she said. Um, so I think I answered the second half of that Thomas Aquinas uh, uh, question already. The two sources of knowledge that I wrote up here were revelation from God, what God shows us is true through his word, and what our minds can work out for ourselves. And, and they just really believe that we could tie those together. Um, but next question. For some reason, everybody finds these poor men's names very funny. But Roger Bacon, and everybody just like that. There's a Francis Bacon, too, which got some titters at high school class last year. What? Yeah, yeah. No, well, he, he's in, well, we won't go, we won't go to Francis Bacon. Um, let's go to Roger Bacon. Not the same as Francis and lived several hundred years before. Not related? Not, re not related as far as I know. <laughs> yes, Paley. He observed and he experimented. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what does that mean? So think about what we do in, in science, in modern science, right? So I look at my water and I say, why does my water sometimes turn to steam and why does it sometimes turn solid? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they knew this at that point. I, I'm just using it as an example because I have water here. So what do I do? I, I, I am in doubt about the answer, and so I test it, right? So I subject it to lev levels of temperature change, and I find out at a certain temperature it turns solid, and at a certain temperature it starts steaming, and I do this over and over again to confirm it, and then I have friends do it too, and you got the same answer that I got, and so after we do that for a while, we think, that must be true. You know, it works for everybody, that if we take water to 32 Fahrenheit, it starts getting hard. It, that must be a universal. Roger Bacon is the first guy who had the idea that that's the way to find things out. Because I, you're going to laugh. But it, what? Oh yes, because Aristotle's BC. Aristotle's about 350 BC. So he's about 2,000 years after Aristotle. And Aristotle did categorize things. He collected and he kept, but he didn't test them. Do you know what I mean? He didn't run experiments on. He thought about them. So, so here now we are a medieval school. We're scholastics, and we're studying water. And here's what we do. Oh, look at the water. I wonder. Let's use our human reason to find out. I, I wonder what happens, how, how we make it get solid. And, and obviously, we are familiar with cold temperatures and hot temperatures, although the, the natural world doesn't usually get hot enough to make your water steam. You know, does it? Two, 212, no, it doesn't get 212 degrees anywhere on Earth, does it? Um, so. 212. Isn't it 212? 100 Celsius? Okay, I'm not, this is not a science class, and there's a reason for that. I don't remember. Did my kids' biology and physical science, and then I put the books away. But they would think about it. They would just ponder it. 
instead of actually testing it. Why, why does, you know, the paper clip fall and at what speed, you know, they would just, know. they would just sit and they would ponder it. And we kind of laugh at that as like, buddy, you need to run some tests because you can't ponder your way into that. This was Roger Bacon's idea. Um, although, I want to point something else that Dorothy Mills said. Um, he taught that human error was due to an undue regard for authority, to a false idea of what knowledge was, to prejudice, and to habit which encouraged mental laziness. All right? And then the, the, what you guys said, that he wanted to observe and experiment. Uh, but here's my question for you. Is there anything that exists that we can't run experiments on? Tell me something that exists that we can't run experiments on. Okay, I wasn't, okay. However, however, you know, he complained, Roger Bacon complained, Dorothy Mills tells us, that he didn't have good enough instruments, right? He always wanted better scientific instruments. If we had the right knowledge and the right instruments, we might be able to test black holes. We might just not have the capability to do that yet. But is there anything that we just never, there will never be an instrument that will test it? You got an idea, Roy? No, but we could make instruments and we could toss them in the volcano. But not if we found the right materials that wouldn't melt. You see, it's just a matter of yeah. we don't have the right instruments. It's like Roger Bacon. It's like if only had the right instruments, I could test the inside. Well, but maybe someday. Okay, yes. Did she just steal your thunder? Okay, this God, the human soul. Love, yes. And well, but but what do instruments measure? What do scientific instruments measure? Physical things, physical things that have matter and substance, right? Physical things that have atoms, so I don't, I'm gonna include air in that, you know? I mean, it doesn't really, I can't feel the air, you know? But yes, or, or waves, something that's, a, but if God is spirit, how, how do we test that, you see? And so the reason I mention this is because Roger Bacon was not trying to say that there was no God. He was not trying to say that if I can't test it with my instruments, it doesn't exist. But there are people who say that now. Do you know that? I mean, you probably know this. That it, not every, there are Christian, wonderful Christian scientists. Don't get me wrong. Science is not evil. I want to make myself perfectly clear. But there are people who revere it so highly that they feel like if I can't touch it and measure it and weigh it and, and, and study it and experiment on it, it must not exist. <laughs> and, uh, and I would say that is wrong. You know? And so their proof that something doesn't exist is, well, we can't test it. Well, but you can only test things that you can feel and they go around in a circle, and these things are outside their circle. Yes, so, so do you see what I mean? So Roger Bacon, great guy, and set the ground for all modern science, but did not foresee, perhaps, that there might someday arise people who think that, well, if I can't do experiments on it, it doesn't exist, it must not be real. But God, the soul, love. What instruments test those? None. Anyway. I feel like I'm preaching today. Yes. Faith, hope, and love. Belief. Um, which doesn't make it not true. Doesn't make it not real. All right. What? What, unicorns? See, I'm, I am, I am, okay. <laughs> did I do this? I did this last year. So some of you know it already and some of you don't. 
I, this is not, I didn't invent this, um, but it's Peter Kraft, the guy who wrote the unaborted Socrates oh, yeah. that we read last year. So I think I told this to you last year. Um, so I was gonna, the reason I'm thinking of this is because Bailey said that unicorns exist. And you know, the fact that I have never seen one and they have not caught one, to me is not proof that something doesn't exist. It just means we haven't found one yet. I mean, it could be proof that, it could be that they don't exist. So we call that, that state of not knowing being an agnostic, all right? Usually use it for, for people, they use it for faith. They say, well, I don't think there's enough proof for God, so I'm not gonna make a decision. Well, that's to your spiritual danger. But we can be agnostics about other things. So I guess I'm a unicorn agnostic. Like, I don't really know, there's not enough evidence. So I told them last year this story that I got from a book. Um, so to know that something exists, what one, or to say that something doesn't exist is a, is a pretty severe statement. So if I, ask, if I told all of you, there is a snake in this room, where would you have to look to know that I was right? Be, be more specific. Way, I only have to look one place to know that you're right. I said, there's a snake in this room. Where do I have to look to say there is a snake in this room? One place. Where the snake is. That's the only place I have to look. I don't have to look over there. If I look down there and that's, that court is a snake. I'm like, you're right, there's a snake in this room. I don't know anything else about the rest of the room. Does that make sense to everybody? I only have to look one place. But if I say there is no snake in this room, where do I have to look? Every single square inch of this room. Now, so if this, the argument in this book was to argue people who say there's no God. If I say there is no God, where do I have to have looked? everything that exists, the entire universe. I have to have knowledge of the entire universe. And who has knowledge of the entire universe? Not you. God. So if I say there is no God, I'm kind of claiming to be God because I must have a knowledge of everything. Okay, that's not, that is not, I didn't invent that. I take no credit. Peter Kraft, the guy. Really? Yes. Hey, what book is it? It's in The Best Things in Life, which has some, well, anyway, we won't talk about that. Okay, there's a reason we didn't read that one. All right, so let's go into books. I asked you to look up the word manuscript. Did anybody do that? Yay! Who? Okay, I'm going to give it to Simeon. Yeah. Manu means by hand, this is Latin, by hand, script, scriptus means written. Okay, well, and this is true. It is a written document but literally. So a manuscript is any, any, we even use manuscript for things that are printed, you know, electronically sometimes. Like there's a manuscript of a book that hasn't been published yet. But literally, manuscript means written by hand. And of course, before 1453, which is the printing press year. Every book that existed was written out word by word by hand by someone sitting. Think about it. Look at the books. Let's see how many books are in this room? I mean, we don't need to count them, but just think about the number of books in this room. Think about the number of books in this church. 
Think about the number of books in your home. And think about how long. See, I've always wanted to do this. What? Sure. They would have had to have been copied by hand, too. Um, it, I've always wanted to do an experiment, but I always do other things and I never do it. I wanted to get some nice pens and some really nice paper. And, you know, I have fountain pens, fancy fountain. They're not very fancy, but no. with different colors. Okay, well, like a clear pen, but even just a normal pen. And I wanted to sit down and start writing out the Bible by hand. And you wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know that I could do it for more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time. You know what I mean? And my hand would get tired and my brain would get tired. And just, I wonder how long it would take me. It just, this is, see, this is experimentation, right? This is Roger Bacon experimentation. I just, I wonder how many hours copying a Bible takes you. Yeah. I say, I, I, for half an hour a day, I am going to write, I'm just going to start in Genesis, I'm going to write, heck, even just the Psalms, you know, just to see how, anyway. Yes, yes, which takes us to th this book I have here. Um, let me see if we've, okay, so we've, we've answered all our questions, so I'm going to lay those aside. Um, so uh, Dorothy Mills tells us about the different types of script, uh, so the different kinds of handwriting. Just, this is not a judgment on anyone or your family, but how many of you have been made to do some sort of handwriting, like cursive or handwriting training, all right? So, and some not, it's getting less common. There is a problem that people then aren't able to read cursive writing that people have written, you know, 50 years ago or, or you know, not even that long. Um, but handwriting styles change, right? What's considered good handwriting changes. And so we have these manuscripts with different sorts of script. She talks about the fact that during Charlemagne's time, there was this, it was called Carolingian because Carolus is Charles in Latin. And, and they would uh, have a certain script, and then sometimes it was very, very tiny. It's actually called minuscule, which means little, you know, tiny. It was a minuscule script. So different scripts over time. Uh, the types of books that they would copy, she tells us, most common were a missile, and not a missile, like not shooting missiles. No. This is missile, M-I-S-S-A-L. It is the... Um, the, the, the daily liturgy for the Catholic Church, it's when you go to church, when you go to Mass, and then they say certain things and you say certain things back. That's the, that's the way it works in, in you know, Catholic and Orthodox, maybe a little Anglican too. Um, so often there's a, there's a give and take. You know, the, the priest says something and then you answer something back. And it was, it was directions. Does that make sense? That's a missal. Um, a Psalter which is just the Psalms. A book of hours. A book of hours is, uh, so, you know, monks in monasteries, we talked about the fact that they pr prayed set times every day. They got up in the night, and they got up just before sunrise, and then they got up after sunrise, and then they had third hour prayers, and, and noon prayers, and in the afternoon, and then evening vespers. And they had these set times, and they would read through Psalms, and there were prayers that they'd say, and that's called um, the Divine Hours or the Divine Office. A book of hours was a book of those prayers. Um, or the Gospels. This is a Psalter. Now, this is another one of the things my crazy son buys me for Christmas. Uh, this is, uh, so, and obviously this has, this, it wouldn't have been, I don't know how big it was. It has illustrations, but a lot of this book is commentary about it, okay? This isn't just the Psalter, a reproduction of it. This is people writing about it and its history. This particular one was started for some reason in England, and then it got taken to an area of Spain and finished in Spain. 
and they kind of, the scholars like to study it and say, oh, we think this part was done in England and this part was done in Spain. But I marked a page so you can see some of the script of the time. I brought in the Book of Kells earlier for you. This is obviously um, a scene from the crucifixion, the picture, and it's from um, Psalm 68, which is one of the uh, Messianic Psalms. It begins, save me, O God, for the waters are come in even unto my soul. And so I'm gonna bring this, oh my goodness. I'm, gonna, I'm blocking my microphone, but it's okay. I'm going to bring this around just so you can take a look. And then I'll, I'll leave it out if you want to look after class. Look at the writing, first of all, the beautiful writing. Can you imagine? Look how... Now, you know how when you try to write on paper with no lines, your lines get all crooked? Do we all know this? It kind of slants one way or another way. So sometimes they would take the, the parchment, the sheepskin, and they would write... They would trace little guidelines in and sometimes and then they try to rub them out and sometimes you can see them later and sometimes you can't. Isn't that beautiful? Can you imagine? I'm telling you when I do my experiment I'm not drawing pictures. Take a look at the beautiful, the beautiful writing. Many of us today don't consider that we have beautiful handwriting because we just don't think it's as important. We don't use it a lot. But, you know, if you were writing God's word out, wouldn't you want to use your very, very best that you could monster up? You know, I feel like I would. Books were beautiful things, but they were rare things because it took so long to copy them. Maybe that's, I think he's giving him the vinegar. Oh, yeah. Um, in that one. Yes. Oh, I thought so, it was uh, sour wine. Yeah, it was like sa sour wine vinegar. It turns on the translation. Um, eventually he did. At first they tried to give him this rug that would deaden the pain, and he did not it because he didn't want to deaden the pain but later on he said I thirst and it says they gave him some vinegar mixed with gall or sorry it depends on your translation um, so they would chain these books to the shelf in monasteries or in libraries when libraries came into vogue and uh, and I'm just gonna dispel we come from different faith backgrounds here and Christian backgrounds, and I, I want to always, like we're all Christians here. If we believe that Jesus is God and he died for our sins, we're all, you know. But um, different traditions sometimes attack other traditions, okay? And this is unfortunate, but it's true. And sometimes uh, the, the Catholic Church has been blamed for wanting to keep the Bible away from people and keeping it chained up. This is not. All the books were chained up. It was because it was so valuable that if somebody just absconded and took with and took home the parish Bible, no one else would have access to it. It wasn't an attempt of the church to not let people read the Bible. Most people weren't able to read it anyway because they, they hadn't learned to read. But all books were chained up. Um, you know, we used to do this. You guys don't know. Your parents know. Uh, they used to chain phone books in the in the photo in the phone booth because if somebody takes off with the phone book, phone isn't gonna do you a lot of good. And you guys are like, what's a phone booth? I don't know what we're talking about. But they used to have a phone book. No, they used to have phone book in the phone booth, and and it was attached by a chain because they didn't want just to stop people from ripping out pages. But uh, you know, you couldn't take off with it. So if, if it took this much effort and time to make a book, they're going to take good care of it, right? Um, so one last thing about... <laughs> oh, don't make me feel old. I already do feel old. Um, what? Um, Last thing I wanted to read because I, okay, what, okay, my glasses are on my head. 
you know, after a while, I don't feel them anymore. Let me read this poem. So the most fun thing that we get from medieval books is sometimes we have these scribes, you know? And, oh, I didn't even read you the rules about the scriptoriums. No candles, because fire hazard, hello. No talking, because have you ever tried to write something while people are talking in the room and then suddenly you're writing what they're saying? I have. Or listening to music. Oh, I can listen to music and do my writing at the same. No, now you're writing the lyrics. You're not writing what you were thinking about. Some, some people are. I was able to do math and watch Bugs Bunny at the same time. <laughs> College. Um, but, uh, so obviously just during daylight hours, and that implies to me that scriptorians must have had good windows if all they had was natural light. But it, it's tiresome. You're working from sunrise to sunset. I mean, just imagine, I dare you to just get up at sunrise one day and spend your entire day copying a book and only take breaks for food. And just see what is the condition of your hand and your brain at the end of the day. So you know what? People, this is what I love about history, people don't really change. People are the same. They feel the same and they react the same in general to certain things. So just like you would, these poor guys eventually like my mind is shot and it's going to wander a little bit because I just can't think about this anymore. And then they would doodle, doodle in the margins or they would write things in the margins. Sometimes they're commentaries like, I can't believe he said this or, you know, and, and obviously these were copies of the Bible. Do you know what? You wouldn't do that to a, a Bible, but lesser books, not holy books, books that aren't going into the church library, but they would just, they would write in the margins. And so we have this lovely example. In the eighth century, an Irish monk once stopped his work long enough to write a poem about his cat. And we have it. His cat's name is Pangerban. I have no comment on that name for a cat. Uh, here it is. I and Pangerban, my cat, tis a like task we are at. Hunting mice is his delight. Hunting words, I sit all night. Better far than praise of men, tis to sit with book and pen. Panger bears me no ill will, he too applies his simple skill. Tis a merry thing to see at our tasks, how glad are we, when at home we sit and find entertainment to our mind. Oftentimes a mouse will stray in the hero Panger's way. Oftentimes my keen thought set takes a meaning in his net. Against the wall he sets his eye full and fierce and sharp and sly. Against the wall of knowledge I all my little wisdom try. When a mouse darts from its den, oh, how glad is Panger then. Oh, what gladness do I prove when I solve the doubts I love. So in peace our task we ply, Panger ban my cat and I. In our arts we find our bliss. I have mine and he has his. Practice every day has made Panger perfect in his trade. I get wisdom day and night, turning darkness into they both chase something in their simple way. One of them is mice and one of them is knowledge. I love it. Yes, Bailey. Yes, a little bit, although there was no, yes. So I would like to recommend over Christmas holidays, I may have already said this once, but A, I can't remember, B, maybe you forgot. Um, there is a movie. And it's about the Book of Kells. And the Book of Kells is the one I brought in when we, uh, I brought it earlier in the year. It's another big book like that. And it's an illustrated book of the Gospels made in Ireland. Yes. 
is a cartoon, The Secret of Kells. Okay, so it's called The Secret of Kells. And I know it is in the library system in Illinois. I, Iowa does not have the awesome interlibrary loan system that Illinois has. But if you can get a hold of a copy, and it's kind of weird. It is a little sad and depressing. But uh, it's, so it's about the writing of this book. And it's interesting because it's illustrated. The animation is m mimicking sort of the animation, the illustrations of a book of that time. And it's about the, so it's a little off of our time period that we're talking about. It's about the, the Northmen invasions. The Vikings are invading. Um, and they've got to save this book, this book, which is going to be the Book of Kells, which has been handed down to us, a book of the Gospels. It is, it is geared towards kids, but I, I enjoy it thoroughly. It's one of those movies that I think anybody could enjoy. Um, and the reason I bring it up now is because there's a character in it who has a cat named Pangerman. And the reason they have a cat named Pangerman is because of that poem I just read you. So it's fun. If you, it's okay if you don't find it or if you're just like, yeah, I don't want to watch Mrs. Ferguson's cartoon. It's all right. But um, it's, it's very odd. All right, I'm just going to warn you. But it also has something to do with the meeting of Christianity and Celtic pagan cultures. So it's just all these things together. But you just have to watch it with an open mind. And it's like, okay, this is going to be a little weird, but I'm going to roll with it. But if you do, watch for the Panger Band. And I think there's even a song that has part of that poem in it. They're singing about Panger Band. All right. I will give you your new reading questions now. Oh, by the way, before I do that, this is the picture. So uh, before I show you the picture, I'll bring it around to each table. Just, But I... Um, sent each of you a copy already. So one of the kinds of books that um, Dorothy Mills told us was popular to copy was a book of hours. And I told you the book of hours was the, the prayers that you say at the different hours of the day and the psalms that you uh, pray or recite. And they had these beautiful books of hours with lots of illustrations, but they, they turned into, do you all know what a farmer's almanac is? It's, it's a book where they tell you, um, oh, they tell you things like the moon phases and the tide and then seasonal things about when you should plant certain things and when harvest and is it going to be a bad winter or a good winter and are there eclipses, you know, and all this natural world stuff. And it got to be something like that. They started, they started uh, adding these into their books of hours. So that sometimes the illustrations in these books weren't so much to go along with the prayers as with the seasons. Does that make sense? Because there was also information about it, about what to do in the different seasons. Yeah, right. Yeah, he, I don't know that he, I don't know if he started it or not. Poor Richard's Almanac. Um, I, it's a good question. If there were farmers, but he took it to the next level. If he didn't invent it, he took it to the next level with all his poor Richard sayings and his, his wit and wisdom. But I do not know the answer to that, Rhett, whether he was the pioneer of that or just new and improved. Uh, so uh, there's a famous book of hours that we have from France. I think it's from the 1400s, 1300s. And uh, its name, if you want to look at some of the other pictures online, it's French, and it means uh, the beautiful, the rich hours. Uh, Trey, Rich, Ur. And so if you Google Trey, Rich, Ur, it shows you, and you hit, uh, hit images, you know, it'll just bring up loads of pictures from this book. But there are pictures of people doing things during different seasons. So I have sent you a picture of, obviously, a planting season. We have a lot of stuff going on in this picture. The accolade was very static, if you know what I mean. It was just like one moment he was doing one thing. This has a lot more going on. Yes, Simeon. 
French. So you see they're plowing, but we have the guy on the horse, the guy on the ground. I, I, when I look at this, I'm just, I'm kind of, this is a springboard for you guys to think about. Are they related? Are they the same social class? They are both working in the field. And what about all those people hanging out by the castle? There's a boat in the moat over there. What are they doing? Was the harvest good last year or was the harvest poor last year, I wonder? Do they have high hopes for this one? And then dig that crazy scarecrow in the middle with the bow. I thought he was a real guy and my students made fun of me. I said, what is that guy standing there? Was he gonna shoot him? And like, he has no feet, Mrs. Ferguson. He's a scarecrow. Not infallible. Not even close. Um, Wait, what? Gonna shoot? What? Uh, the, the scarecrow with the bow in the middle. But he has no feet. He's supposed to be standing on one leg. I thought there was a person yeah, he just has one leg. I like it. <laughs> I'm going to tell my other students, take that. He's a one-legged archer. He's not a scarecrow. So this is the picture we're going to write from. And Julia, any, any picture, if you want to do one of these again, because they're kind of fun. It's kind of the middle of the year and Christmas time, and we want to take a little break. Any picture from the time period you're studying? This will work for. Um, so I sent this to each of you. I'll send it to you too if you want to do that one, but if you find another one, that's great. Um, it's a what? I don't know. Well, it's it's multi-purpose. It's multi-purpose. He can walk and then stop and shoot people when he needs to. Um, so remember how this assignment works. I'm not going to bother to write it on the board. Based on the stories that I got from you, I think everybody's got the, got the idea. So we have three paragraphs. The first paragraph, I would like you to tell me what has happened in the past to lead up to the moment of this picture. You can go back into the far past. You can go back into that morning or the night before. Don't care. All right? You might want to include who these people are, right? Um, and, and how they got there, where are they? I don't care that this is a French manuscript. You can put these people wherever you want, all right? Um, what are they planting? Uh, well, I guess that would be the second paragraph, wouldn't it? So this is, this is the past. Second paragraph, what's happening now? How long have they been working? What time of day is it? What are they planting? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? Are they wishing those people who are in those boats and in the background were out there helping them? And what are those people in the background thinking about them? You probably can't include all of that because then your story would be really, really long. But those are things to choose from. Yeah, Bailey. Sure, if you want to do a sequel, your accolade guy could be in that castle. He could be ready to come out and, and help. He's, he's abandoning knighthood, and he's going to come out and live well, the peasant's life. Right so he decides to just go kill time out and help him in the fields, because I like it. Yeah, I like it. OK, just a second. Alice has two questions. Guys, go. Um, that is up to you, Alice. I hate to. Sometimes it's easier to be told one way or another, but if you want to choose one of those people to be a main character and, 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 and revolve your story around it, that's great. And if you want to be sort of one of those narrators that's outside and you see into everyone, that's fine too. What was your second question? Absolutely, absolutely. So Alice's question is, could, could the first paragraph be sort of a flashback? You could say, you know, wearily they were planting the field, and then your first paragraph could say, they'd been planting this all winter, and we're hoping for a great crop, and you get the idea. Oh, yeah, yes, that's totally fine. And then your final paragraph would be, what do you think is going to happen next? This could be the next day or that evening. It could be the far future. It could be. Is the crop going to go well? Or are locusts and drought going to starve the castle? Oh, but C 
see, I feel, you say, Jacob and Simeon are all over, yeah, yeah, we're starving the castle. That sounds good. <laughs> does that, does everyone understand? All right, I would like you to include both kinds of parallelism and a strong verb. Some of you have been really good about that, and some of you still are forgetting. Yes, Addie. Can you say that again? Um, yeah, you know, okay, so here's, here's your choice. I feel like when I give you guys two weeks, I get better results. Although, I know there are some of you that two weeks is code for, I do nothing this week, and then I do it all the second week. But it would be ideal if you did it this week, and then you could bring it to me before we stop for Christmas break. Okay, well, oh, shall I do this now? I'll do this now. You know what? I really don't like the blue books. I don't like it in this sort of class. I like it. It's good when you're studying math and science and things like that. But it's very, very hard for me. And it's, very, it's hard for some of you to put together everything. It's easier for the high schoolers because I can ask themes running through books. But we read sort of random things from different time periods. And I just don't know that it's, I would rather you spent your effort on writing good papers for me. So I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this or not, but I, I just feel like we're not going to do that this year. Because it, I don't like giving you guys things to do that I feel are just keeping you busy or jumping through my hoops. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing that to you. When I give you things to write, I really have a purpose in it. And I don't feel like that has much purpose except, well, I have to do that because they said I have to. So, I'm not doing it. I will not promise you won't have anything to write over Christmas, but you probably will not. Because people do travel and it gets difficult. All right. I'm sure you really look broken hearted. You all look grieved, but I don't, I don't think I'm gonna do that. And I never did do it in class. And that was the other hard thing. I would give it to you the last day that I saw you and then I wouldn't get it back from you till January, you know, and you're, it would take so long for you, and then I have to take it home and read them all for a week. So it's so many weeks before you hear back from me about, about it, I just feel like maybe I will think of, oh, I'll have to think about this. Maybe over Christmas you could just write one overarching, just, and just tell me about this. Just, here's a question or idea, tell me what you think about this. Something like that instead. Yes, Bailey. See, I don't know. I don't, I feel like, see, I don't want to do that because, you know, if you, if you read it and you paid attention in class, you know. But I'm not here to teach you and make, you, make sure you memorize every single fact that Dorothy Mills tells you. Remember, we're looking at the deeds of great men and how they can be emulated and the deeds of wicked men and how they should be avoided. And it's not really a testable thing. Your test will be your life. Check back with me in 30 years. <laughs> Let me see what your life is like. And then I'll know if I did anything good. Um, okay, so we are reading chapter 20. Uh, chapter 20 is a little bit, I know some people find Dorothy Mills a little dry in general. But it's, it's a little on the dry side, even for Dorothy Mills. Um, it's about uh, the constitutional developments in rulership in England and France. But it's really important because um, England and France spend the late Middle Ages fighting each other for over 100 years. And their histories are kind of important. Their histories are also important because England and France both suffered much later rebellion and revolution. One of them was the American Revolution. One of them was the French Revolution. And they're very different creatures. But the roots of that start here. So I wanna, I wanna read this and talk about it. But so, what? You said you're gonna read the 
No, you're going to read chapter 20. Read this, oh, chapter 20. I don't know. If I said that, Bailey, I was babbling, <laughs> which may be the case. So, okay, I guess I didn't answer that. If you decide to spend two weeks because you are writing an epic, um, which I would love, I do not mind if you email it to me that second week, all right? So I guess I will officially give you two weeks to write this. However, if you want to, to bring it to me next week and just have it done, I'm, I'm fine with that. But spend some time on it. Every single one of you has a good imagination. I know it. But sometimes we don't take the time to let it play. So take some time to let it play. If you have trouble, did I, did I give you too many questions? I know, I'm sorry, I forgot to punch holes. You give me two weeks off and I totally lose it. Deal with it, deal with it. Uh, just a second on Robin Hood. So uh, you don't have to write this down, but I want y'all to look here because some people write stories and your ideas just fly. <clears throat> And, and it's not a problem coming up with ideas. Some people, it helps to know where you're going and think it out a little bit, okay? One's not right and one's not wrong, it's just different sorts of people. So consider, consider making yourself an outline like we have done with your points. It could be five or seven, I don't, I don't care, it doesn't matter. At least four, all right? and jot down paragraph one before, paragraph two, the picture, paragraph three, after, and just before you just grab your pen and your paper and you just start writing and you're not sure where it's gonna go, jot down a path. Ask yourself, who, who are these people? Where are they? And what, what, has happened what has happened to lead to this point and then just ask your brain these questions and jot down some ideas you know what you might not use all the ideas you jot down that's okay just kind of get them out of your brain because if you're like me if you don't get them out of your brain they hide you know you ever had those ideas they you had it and then it ran and hid it's like, oh it was a good idea and now i don't know what it was and do the same thing. Look at the picture and ask yourself, what is this guy? Is that guy his brother? Is that guy his boss? If we want to tie in your accolade night, what's he doing right now? Who lives in the castle? Or the, is it time of war? Is it time of peace? Just, just start churning out ideas. And then do the same thing. What do you think is going to happen here the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, five years, 10 years, however big a scale you want, and just jot down ideas. Then you've got a pattern when you sit down to write, okay? And you can pick and choose from the stuff that you've gotten out of your brain. And you don't have to think about writing and think about ideas at the same time. Does that make sense? It, it, it helps some people. It really does. Okay, Robin Hood. So, some students, I don't know if there's anybody in here, I've had students say, I know zero about Robin Hood. Never saw the movie, never, nothing. So that would be very fun. Some of you maybe have seen multiple versions of Robin Hood. Um, the Disney version, I, by the way, if you have not, if you have not ever watched a movie version of Robin Hood, don't watch it until you finish the book. Please, I am begging you, don't watch it until you finish the book. Um, the Disney version is very altered, as Disney versions are, considering A, they are all animals. It's very humorous. There is a version with Kevin Costner, which, uh, I, I, okay, 
Kevin Costner takes a, a, a bath and he's not wearing any clothes, which is the most objectionable. But it's, it's kind of, I don't know. We like Alan Rickman. You know what I mean? Carve his heart out with a spoon. Okay, um, <laughs> my children still say that. Um, I'm not familiar, there's an old Errol Flynn, a very old black and white Robin Hood. So, you know, it's kind of fun after you read a book to, to chase down a movie version and see what they've done with it. Uh, your parents can guide you on what is appropriate. Yes, Bailey. Um, so how did Robin become an outlaw in the first place? Yeah, Alice. He was poaching. That's the term for killing animals, you know, illegally. He was poaching deer. The way England worked at the time was that all the deer in what we would today consider a public of a forest preserve belonged to the king and so if the deer were in that forest they were his deer and i don't care if your hung family is hungry which is a bummer all right and you can see how that would tick people off what do you mean there's a bunch of deer in that forest and my kid is starving to death Ooh, you can't shoot the deer. But people did. Wait, All right. <laughs> Just because they weren't allowed doesn't mean they didn't do it. I don't know. There were various forested areas that were belonging to the king. This particular forested area was Sherwood Forest. But there were various areas that the king just claimed ownership of. And so all that was there was his. Instead of just giving the peasants, you can go hunt in the woods. That would have been nice. Here, I'm sorry, Roy. I'm going to move over. Poor Roy's got this. Having to lean over. Apparently. I don't know that he ever went out and did it. Um, so this is what Robin Hood is initially doing illegally. And it is illegally, but in that time, it was kind of understood that if you could get away with it, you, you did it because you needed the meat. Okay. So I'm, not, I'm not usually one to say, yeah, it's illegal, but go ahead and do it anyway. I don't want you to get that impression. But it was very common. But it was illegal, and you could get, in pun uh, get punished for it. So he runs into these, um, uh, what is it, foresters, the king's foresters that guard the deer and they know what he's doing and they have an encounter he does not kill a man because they know he's poaching deer why does he kill a man oh. okay a the guy shot at him now the arrow did not hit him so okay so we well uh, uh, hold on to that. So the, an arrow, he, he walked away, and this forester whizzed an arrow by him. Now, I can take this in two ways. Way one, he's a really bad shot. <laughs> or, and or drunk. What, what is way two we could take it? Warning. Warning. I could have hit you if I'd wanted to, but I didn't want to, but you better watch out. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as gracious to this guy as I can. But there is a secondary reason why Robin Hood turned around and shot him. Did he was angry. Yes, he probably does, I mean, his anger management issues. But, but, he was being really dissed. Do people even, is that now an old fashion? Is that what, something that old ladies say because they think it's hip? Um, <laughs> or do people still say that? Um, 
They teased him about being a baby. They called him Little Lad. Halloa, where goest thou, little lad, with thy one penny bow and thy farthing shafts? Like toy. Your little toy bow and your little toy arrows, aren't you cute? And uh, so he shoots. He shoots remarkably well. Well, no, I mean, he shoots at a, a mark. He shoots, shoots at a stick to show how well he can shoot, that he's not okay. Um, just a second, I'm, I'm trying to see where I want to start. Never a word said Robin Hood, but he looked at the foresters with a grim face because they've been insulting him and saying, you know, catch him. Nay, said a fourth, let him e'en go because of his tender years. He was a kid, just let him go. Never a word said Robin Hood, but he looked at the foresters with a grim face. Then turning on his heel, strode away from them down the forest glade. But his heart was bitterly angry, for his blood was hot and youthful and prone to boil. Now, well would it have been for him who had first spoken had he left Robin Hood alone. But his anger was hot, both because the youth had gotten better of him and because of the deep drafts which he had been quaffing. There's your drunkenness. So of a sudden, without any warning, he sprang to his feet, seized his bow, and fitted it to a shaft. I cried he, I'll hurry thee anon. And he sent the arrow whistling after Robin. All right, so I guess Ella is more right than me. It was well for Robin Hood that the same forester's head was spinning with ale, or else he would never have taken a single step. As it was, the arrow whistled within three inches of his head. He turned back around, quickly drew his bow, and sent one arrow back in return. Okay. The shaft flew straight. The archer fell forward with a cry and lay on his face on the ground, his arrows rattling about from him and out of his quiver. The gray goose shaft wet with his heart's blood. Then before the others could gather their wits about them, Robin Hood was gone into the depths of the greenwood. Some started after him, but not with much heart, for each feared to suffer the death of his fellow. So presently they all came and lifted the dead man up and bore him away to Nottingham Town. Now listen to this. Meanwhile, Robin Hood ran through the greenwood. Gone was all the joy and brightness from everything, for his heart was sick within him, and it was borne in upon his soul that he had slain him. He's now on the run because there's a price on his head, right? A, poacher, but B, killing the king's forester, murder. So he has to retreat to the woods. Go ahead, say again. Yes, yeah, sheriff, right? The sheriff's, the sheriff's, yes, was a kinsman of the sheriff of Nottingham. How does the sheriff make a living? <laughs> What did you think? Answer what you thought I was going to ask. Well, I thought you were going to ask, um, why did the sheriff like that? Mm. And ask, answer that then. Um, well, uh, I thought the stone lineup was first because of the price. Yes. And then second because he made a guy. Okay. So the sheriff taxes people, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you... It's notorious among tax collectors. This was Roman tax collectors. This is medieval. You take more than they owe you, and you keep part of it. You squeeze as much as you can out of people, and then you keep the rest. This is why people hate the tax collectors. And so, but, so Robin Hood now, I know I have to let you go. Robin Hood is on a path of stealing and providing money to the poor and money for his own men. Other people who are disenchanted who have had to go flee to the woods. What kind of people does he target? The rich. Okay, the rich. What does, what does he think is true about most of these rich people? In what way? In what way? <laughs> what? Okay. They hoard, they press the poor, they squeeze the poor. And that's how they get their money. 
So remember, just briefly, the sheriff, we'll talk about more of these stories next week. I'll leave a little more extra, extra time. The sheriff, remember the time when Robin Hood takes it in his mind to become a, a butcher and a meat salesman? And just because he does things like that, he's like, hey, I'm going to just be a meat salesman. And he was giving away, like discounting meat if he got kisses from pretty girls. Do you remember this story? Like, I'll give it to you three pennies less because you gave me a kiss. Um, and of course, the sheriff sees him and he thinks some jerk rich guy who has his dad's money and doesn't know the value of a dollar. I can get him good. This is an illustration of how the sheriff operates, right? So I'll invite him to dinner. And he just thought, oh, I've got some cattle and I'd really like to sell them. He offers him way below market price because he thinks the stupid kid won't know the difference. Oh, he does know the difference. And when he gets taken to Sherwood Forest and finds out that the cattle are the deer and he gets the shakedown that they give them in Sherwood Forest, he learns his lesson. But some people, do you notice how some people are confronted by Robin Hood and they join him? Yeah. We've just whacked each other with staffs for half an hour. Hey, you want to join me? Sure. Let's be friends. Love it. And some people he encounters become his bitter enemies, like the sheriff. Um, in the next, so I want you to read parts four and five next week. Parts four and five. And there's going to be another group of people. Oh, five and six. Yeah, whatever. I'm tired too. Okay, five and six. And you're going to meet another class of people who are oppressors. It's the men of the church. Remember we talked about that in fact when the monasteries become wealthy, they become greedy. They're also, they're supposed to be feeding the poor. They are squeezing the poor for every cent they can get out of them. And you're going to read some stories about that. Okay, thank you for letting me go over. I'm sorry. Go to your next place. So sorry I kept you over.